I'd like to introduce our keynote speakers this morning. Over a decade ago, Mike Burton met an incredible friend. Over the years, they have shared many experiences and overcome many obstacles and have helped each other discover their mutual talents. Their friendship has translated into a universal message. Their story has been featured in over 200 newspapers across the globe. They have performed their live stage show for almost 20,000 people. It is now our pleasure, APSI's pleasure, to present Mike Berkson and that incredible friend, T Tim Wombick. They are handicapped this, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Welcome, APSI. Th thank you for having us. And we are, I'm very excited to be here at the J.R. Ewing Marriott. And three people got that joke. <laughs> it's a little early for a Dallas reference, I guess. <laughs> thank you, five people. <laughs> anyway. So, like we said, like they were mentioning at the beginning, that there's a lot of people um, from different states all over the U.S. and all over the world. But I wanted to ask you guys, like, is there anybody from Boston here? There are a few Bostons. We're sorry. Yeah, we're sorry. <laughs> we're from Chicago, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> if anyone was on the 21st floor last night and heard some screaming, that was us. Yes. No, they... If anyone heard them jumping, that was him. <laughs> the screaming was me, the jumping was him. Hey Mike, we're on, the, we're on the big screen over there. Yes, we, yes we are. Did, did they get our good side? I don't of know. Course, I, I, I'm, I'm, of course, well, they, they, they say that the camera adds 10 pounds, right? How many cameras are on me? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Man, you stole it from me. you got to be quicker, Mike. I know. <laughs> but what I would do, I'm like... Do I, do I want to make that joke? Do I do I want to go? Do I want to go there? But I was a, I was a second behind you. You were being respectful. Yes, which is rare for me, I think. <laughs> but like I said, oh yeah, I'm my birthday. I have zero palsy. I'm Tim Wambach, and I do not. I. I started working with Mike in the summer of 2001. Oh, it feels a lot longer than that. <laughs> Does, doesn't it? Yeah, it's like a marriage. <laughs> like, a ma <laughs> like a marriage? I want a divorce. Oh, come on. <laughs> I tell you, I tell you. Yes, yes. See, I, I didn't know it at the time, 12 years ago, but I was for Mike. And I was looking for Tim. Everybody is looking for somebody. And what we're going to do here today is we want you to share in our journey. Take our journey with, take, we want to take you on our journey. <laughs> Very well said. And, I, and, and, I'm the, and I'm the one with the speech impediment. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Right. So, yeah, thank our, thank, our, thank our journey with us. Come with us on our journey. Yeah, That's yeah, funny. what he said. Yeah, that works. Anyway, I was born two minutes after my twin brother, David, and my twin brother, he is also able-bodied and more identical, so the only way you can draw us apart is by the walking. <laughs> now, they are so much alike. Here's a, a quick story. Um, so Mike and, and David, didn't all, when they were growing up, they didn't always go to the same school because... There was other schools that were more accessible for Mike. So one day, Mike was sick, and he wasn't going to be going to school. And uh, Mike's parents were, were working with Mike and, and taking care of him, and the bus came to pick up Mike. Now, the bus driver never knew about David. So Mike's parents said, hey, David, why don't you go tell the bus driver that Mike is sick? So David gets up, runs out to the, to the bus. The bus driver opens the door looks at David, praise Jesus, he can walk! <laughs> and then, and then, next day, I come out and I say, don't praise Jesus, 
The miracle didn't take. <laughs> so, <laughs> true story. We couldn't make that up if I tried. <laughs> anyway, when I was born, I was di I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, and the do the doctor told my parents two things. They told them I wouldn't be able to talk. Good job, doctor. The way to make the big bucks, and that also means, what to your people's chagrin, that I am able to do karaoke. <laughs> so put on some very white or Tupac, and I think we'll be. I think we'll be good. I mean, those are the only songs I know. But but the, but they also said, aside from the fact that I wouldn't be able to talk, that I wouldn't lead an ordinary. I know ordinary life. Well, the thing is, the doctors weren't right about that, Mike. You don't lay, lead an ordinary life. You lead an extraordinary life, my man. Now, Mike's twin brother, David, was born able-bodied, whereas Mike, like he said, was diagnosed with cerebral palsy shortly after birth. And there are many different types of cerebral palsy. And what I have is called mixed quadruplegia. And what then, and mid quad having mid quad breathing, it's a lot of fun. Because my arms don't work, my legs don't work, my torso doesn't work, my facial muscles don't work right. Basically, nothing works the way it should, which is a lot of fun. And I. Why don't you give an, why don't you give an example of, of, the, of, the, of how your brain works and, or doesn't oh, work? Oh, yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> Well said. Oh, um, <laughs> I kind of slipped that in there. Anyway, it's kind of like the it's kind of like this. My 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 brain will say to my body, "Take up that ball and throw it," and my body will say, "Okay, uh, how the heck do I do that?" And to continue with the to give you guys some other examples of like stuff that. Because my brain is not hooked up to my body like an able-bodied person. So where an able-bodied person can stand up, come on, able-bodied person, stand up. Am I going to be a visual aid here? Yeah, yes. Oh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, jumping jacks? Uh, Yes. <laughs> All right, that's it. <laughs> oh, do what's giving early early in the morning. Let's see, Heisman <laughs> and Shimmy. You call that a Shimmy? I say Shimmy. All right, Mike, I think, I think this able-bodied person has seen enough, and I think the audience has seen enough. Not according to them, because one person just went, woo. <laughs> now, Mike does have some unique characteristics. For one, he slouches, so every once in a while, we'll have to readjust. Wee. <laughs> and I'll make, that, I'll make that noise every time he does that, because that's what we call in the business a running joke. He also coughs a lot, even when he's not sick. You see fluids build up in Mike's lungs. That's why I'm really good at hugging Louise. <laughs> Poor thing. And as you can see, there's no one right directly in front of Mike. No, so. no, there are a few people. Well, no, no, the, the three right in front of us are all empty. So that, yeah, that's your target. No, so I'll, I'll aim to the left and the right. <laughs> I want to aim for the people. Well, you want to give them a souvenir? Yeah, yes. So aside from um, all the things that, he, that I can do, the other thing that I have to deal with is um, I'm in a lot of pain all the time because my brain sends signals to my body that says, like it'll say like your, your foot hurts or your, um, or your arm hurts, or you have a, you have a headache, and it'll feel really bad. 
But it's just like the syrup of only telling my body to do that. Or telling my body that's how I feel. So to get up in the morning, just to be able to get up get up here on the stage, I have to take like twenty-five pills. So I'm kinda of like a walking Pfizer. Well, not a walking Pfizer, a rolling Pfizer. <laughs> But like, like right now, my my leg is killing me. Everything, everything. There's not one day where my body doesn't hurt. And I don't think I just wanted to tell you guys that, not for sympathy or anything. Just so you guys kind of know some of the other things that you have to deal with when you when you are living with cerebral palsy. Now, like I said before, I started working with Mike in the summer of 2001. Basically, I was hired to do the things for Mike that he wasn't able to do for himself. Which are a lot, including um, feeding, dressing, and going to the bathroom, just to name a few. So, now... And don't worry, we will get to going to the bathroom. <laughs> there we, we do talk about that. So, so our, our, our first solo adventure of Mike and I was a trip to the mall. Mike loves shopping for movies and music, and he loves the food court. So we were both really excited. Now, we rolled in to the mall. I noticed people's reactions to seeing Mike. They'd see Mike, and they would immediately look away. They would pull their kids in closer, and they'd rush past us, as if they'd catch what Mike has, simply by making eye contact or coming too close. Mike's a handsome devil. What's not to love about a slouchy kid with branch-like arms and thick glasses with a goofy, sometimes drooling grin? That's my e Hardy profile, by the way. <laughs> 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 and believe me, it's not really working. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the slouching would be enticing, uh, I guess. <laughs> but it is not. So anyway, sorry, continue. <laughs> They didn't see the light in Mike's eyes. They didn't hear his razor-sharp wit. They didn't feel his caring heart. They didn't get to experience Mike's infectious laughter. Ha ha. <laughs> see? Infectious. Infectious. <laughs> they simply saw, I don't know, a deformed kid in a wheelchair. They never saw Mike. Now, our first dining experience, where I actually fed Mike, was later that same day. Oh, uh, yes, and I had a hanger in for some, for some Taco Bell. Here, 12 year old kid at the time, this is 12 years ago, Mike says, I have a hankering for Taco Bell. Hankering? What kind of 12 year old uses that? What does that even mean, Mike? I know what it means. It's, it's somewhere between a craving and a yearning. <laughs> I've never yearned for anything, by the way. Duly noted, duly <laughs> noted. So, so. We, off to Taco Bell we went, which actually kind of turned out like Taco Hell, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, Mike introduced this to me by ordering... Two hard shell tacos. Now, eating hard shell tacos by yourself can be pretty messy, but you know, when you're feeding someone, it takes on a whole new level. Now, again, like I said, this was the first time that I was ever feeding Mike. And, I mean, he... It was, it was getting pretty ugly. Mike had... Tortilla on his torso, he had beef on his belly, he had lettuce on his lap, he had salsa on his sock, he had cheese in places that you don't want cheese. And, and we're, we're still finding cheese to this day. Still finding it. <laughs> you doing that, you doing that area? <laughs> maybe that's why I can't get a date. Maybe that's what, maybe that. Hey, that's what it is. But to continue his alliteration, it was a tornado of tostados, an avalanche of avocados, a hurricane of hot sauce. <laughs> there. Don't forget, sometimes this was not so accidental. <laughs> now, feeding Mike the first time, obviously, I'm getting frustrated. I'm really getting frustrated. I mean, Mike looked like he had, was in a food fight and lost, right? 
And this is my first time, and I'm like going, I'm sweating bullets. Mike is He's running like he was in a lineup. <laughs> so, Mike, being the intuitive 12-year-old boy he was at the time, Mike looked at me, and he said, And no need to cry or spilled Taco Bell. No need to cry over spilled Taco Bell. So it was at that moment that I was hooked. Hooked on helping Mike in any way that I possibly could. So, you know, we cleaned up. And it took a while. It always takes a while. The thing about that little experience, though, was right then and there, Mike made my mind handicap accessible. One thing, the one thing about growing up with cerebral, cerebral palsy is when I was little or younger, let's say between the ages of like two and like, let's say eight, it never occurred to me that I was, that I was different. I did this too, okay, I was in a wheelchair and my brother wasn't. And I had to do things that my brother didn't have to do. But I just assumed that that's what everybody did. Like, I'm in a wheelchair. Other people are in wheelchairs. This is what people do. Some people aren't, some people aren't. And we go on and we, we live our lives the way we live them. And we do what we need to do and we just we we focus on we focus on our strength and not on our differences because when I was a kid, no one ever treated me differently. Like I was never aware that I was different than any other kid. But that changed when I got to school because when I got to school is when I first started to realize how different my situation was from the rest of my fellow classmates and the rest of everybody I knew, even outside of school. Now, there have been some major advancements in the mainstreaming of special. But some teachers still have a lot to learn. One of the things they wanted me to learn was, they wanted me to use a power wheelchair. And as you can see, I'm not using it now. <laughs> because they said, it would make my life easier and make me more independent. Well, guess what? They were wrong. <laughs> See, Mike's teachers, like Mike said, they, they told him that you know, it would make his life easier, he'd be more independent, that all he had to do was practice. And you know, Mike did practice day in and day out, week in and week out. It was like that training sequence in Rocky. <laughs> 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 Just every day, training, <laughs> and it never got any easier. So, like, it would make me so tired. Because, okay, so Mike had to use his, his left hand with, with the joystick. And using that, I mean, did it take you a long time to get to class? Yeah, because I would, I would, have, to, I would have to go through the hallway because I, I, was in regular, I was in regular ed, I was in regular ed classes, so. I would have to, so we had passing periods, we had all kinds of stuff like that, and we have <laughs> we <laughs> told you. Oh, um, you missed one earlier. I know, but, I, <laughs> but there was a there was a pause in the story. So anyway, so we would have five minute passing periods, and I swear to God, every time it was time for a passing period. It seemed like everybody was going in the opposite direction I was going. So it was like swimming against the current. So it would take me like a long time to get to class. And then I would get to class and they would go, why are you late? And I said, I'm late. Because you told me I had to use this. You're the reason I'm late because you told me I had to do this. No, I didn't say that to them, but that would, that's what I was so, thinking. So, so you're late, and, and then now, as you were navigating the hallways and, and getting to the classroom, it took a lot of mental energy out of you. So, like, when you got to class, what kind of shape did you show up in? Not, not, I was not 
in any shape to mentally participate in any of the gla- in any of the classes. And and as you were navigating the hallways, was someone with you to open a door? Yes. And was someone with you to push a button on an elevator? Yes. So how was that really making you independent if someone was with you anyway? My point exactly. <laughs> and not only that, but you're getting to class late, and then you're tired so that you're not really learning as much as you could learn, like all the, re- all the rest of the kids. Right. And like, it's kind of like, like this. It's got like thinking or participating in class is what made me truly and really, truly independent. Yeah, because, you see, what happened there was Mike's teachers never put themselves in Mike's specific situation. They assumed that Mike's independence was a mobility issue. When in actuality, Mike's independence is his his ability to communicate. One size does not fit all. And one thing real quick, one of the other things, well, finally, after years of working on the chair, they finally said, hey, I think you're right, the chair doesn't work. And I said... You see, the, <laughs> the other thing they wanted me to do, and I could do a whole hour on this, but I'm not. The other thing they wanted me to do was, they said, you must take driver's ed. And I said, sure, I'll do it. I hope you have really good insurance. Because <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, that just goes to show you what their thought process was. Anyway. The one thing I liked about school was having an aid because they tended they tended to see me and not just the chair. But even they couldn't protect even they couldn't protect me from the stereotypes that that I would have to face on a daily basis. Now you see, Mike can't physically write. So in order to take a test Mike would have to dictate his answers to his aide. And to know to not disrupt the whole class, Mike would dictate his answers to his aide out in the hall. I can't, I can't write, nor can I whisper. <laughs> and so, I would, so we, were, we were sitting in class, and somebody would read me the answer. Somebody would read me that question, and I would yell out, six. And everybody would write down, six. <laughs> So they said, we can't have that. Go in the hall. <laughs> no, they didn't say it. They didn't say anything like that. But then. So one time I take the test. I do the test just like Tim said. And I hand it in the next day. Or I hand it after I take it. And the next day I'm pulled off to the side. And the, and the teacher pulled me aside and she goes, Mike, you got the highest score in the class. Pretty good. Mike, it was significantly higher than anybody else in the class. Even better. But um, then she said something that stuck with me to this day and this is why I still bring it up every time we do one of these uh, speeches. She said, Mike, I want you to tell me the truth. Did your aid help you with the answer to the test? And I couldn't believe it. She actually thought I was kidding. And this was a special ed teacher, no less. Um, so, I read my brain and I read my brain and it finally occurred to me that it was as simple as this. The only way that she could imagine that someone who was physically handicapped could get the, such a good grade was by cheating. Now my first thought about this was I was angry. Like I went home and I said, like, I said to my mom, you're not gonna believe this. You're not gonna believe this. <laughs> this is a new one. Um, but then, what I, what I felt was standards for that teacher's ignorance. Now, there are some teachers that you know just don't get it. 
hopefully there's a lot of teachers that do get it. They're, all, they're able to think outside the box and not teach a student uh, as an example in some textbook, but as an individual. Would bring, would bring that to my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Lesniak. Mr. Lesniak was one of those teachers that he just, he, he, he knew that Mike had a lot to offer. He knew that Mike had a lot to say and he wanted Mike to participate in class like, like all the rest of the students. He didn't see Mike as a problem. He saw Mike as a student with a problem and he was going to help solve it. And this particular problem was that I couldn't raise my hand. I'm raising my hand right now. Well, I'm trying to, and I'm I'm exhausted. <laughs> so so that so that they would say they would say, Mike, you gotta raise your hand. You can't call out. And I said, okay, I'll get right on that after I deal with the walking. <laughs> now again, I didn't say that, but that's what I was, that's what I was thinking. Um, but Mr. Lundin came up with the perfect solution. Mr. Lesnick actually came up with the perfect illumination. Ah, you'll see. <laughs> so Mr. Lesniak, what he, what he created was he created a light that attached to the back of Mike's chair with the power source on his, on his armrest. All Mike would have to do was press a button and a light would go on above Mike's head. That way a teacher would know Mike wanted to be called on. And and nobody could ignore that. <laughs> Man, I wish I had that. That would have been a really good way to get women. <laughs> Maybe. But um, the thing the thing about Mr. Lesnick was he not the first teacher. He wasn't just the first teacher that asked me what I needed. He was the first teacher that tried to understand what I was going through on a, on a daily basis. And for that, I will ever be eternally grateful. If there's one thing I learned in school, is this. And this can be, this thing, I, this uh, lesson I learned can be extrapolated, it can be taken out into other context. Actually, it's a perfect lesson or the perfect idea for a conference like this one. You, you can really use this in the uh, getting a job or finding work in a field. It's not what other people say you cannot do, but it's what you know you can do. Right, and you know, Mike and I, you know, we, we try to do something a little different at every one of these speeches and we try to find something that really really applies to, to the whole group. We found a quote, or actually we found a little story that I think um, really applies to, to what APSI's all about, what everyone here's all about. And it, it, the, the, the story is about Helen Keller and Mark Twain. Kind of give you a little historical perspective. And this little story is about the first time that Helen Keller met Mark Twain. This is what she said. The instant I clasped his hand in mine, I knew that he was my friend. He made me laugh and feel thoroughly happy by telling some good stories, which I read from his lips. He knew with keen and sure intuition many things about me and how it felt to be blind and not to keep up with the swift ones. Things that others learned slowly or not at all. He never embarrassed me by saying how terrible it is not to see or how dull life must be lived always in the dark. Twain never patronized her. He never made me feel that my opinions were worthless, as so many people do. He knew that we do not think with our eyes and ears, and that our capacity for thought is not measured by our five senses. He kept me always in mind while he talked, and he treated me like a competent human being, and that is why I loved him. And the thing here that I think was really important with what Mark Twain really uh, established was, you know, he had the willingness to understand. And that's kind of what we're up here talking about and what you guys are all doing is, is we want to help other people understand. And that's you know, a very powerful, powerful message. And some, some, of, our, some of our most influential and important moments 
happen in the mo most unlikely of places. In our case, it was the bathroom. <laughs> See, you know, one of my responsibilities as Mike's one-on-one -on -one aide was to, to help him in the bathroom. The highlight of his day. <laughs> For sure, Mikey, you got us out of class. And yeah, you flexed your muscles. Hey, you flexed your muscles too, my friend. That I did. <laughs> okay, so as you can imagine, getting your diverted by somebody else can be pretty, can be pretty uncomfortable. But Tim made it fun. You turned into a show. Well, I mean, it is a pretty big production with the diaper and the wipes and all that stuff and the powder and I mean everything. It's a pretty big production. But like the old saying goes, the shortest distance between two people is laughter. So that's what I did. Anything, and I mean anything, to make Mike laugh. Oh, and we mean anything. I'll give you two, I'll give you uh no example. So he would do everything from really, 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 really Really bad rapping. Bridges, though. I'm gonna make you laugh. I'm gonna make you dance. I don't want to know what's in your pants. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that went over better than it did when you did it in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but that that was it didn't stop there. Thank God. Um, he also did. Uh, let's say mediocre impressions. I did not have sex relations with that woman. <laughs> and, and for those of you who are under eh, 15, that would be our former president, Bill Clinton. But that's not the only Clinton we have. We have. We have a plethora of questions. Why don't, why don't you do the other ones? I feel your pain. Now I'm going to powder your butt. <laughs> apparently, 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 that's the only person you can do. <laughs> just, just feel good and say different things. But nevertheless, our best material was organic. Organic? Like the time you peed on me? Hey, hey, just like <laughs> my muscle. But really, you know, the, the fun and games in the bathroom, and just the fun and games in general, really set the stage for us to have some real conversation. When I got into high, when I got, when I got into high school, I had a really tough time. My freshman year, my freshman year was very, was very, very difficult on me. Um, I would, like I said, I was never in special ed, so I was in all these regular ed classes. And every, like I said earlier, every class was in a different room. So every day I would go through the hallways. And I would see all these people walk, and it was a reminder of everything I couldn't do, and everything I never, I would, I would never be able to do. And this made me very upset. Um, you know, everywhere I looked, it was a constant reminder. Now this made me really upset. Like I said. To compound that, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know who to talk to. I didn't think I could talk to anyone. I didn't know how to articulate what what this felt like. Yeah, I felt like there was no one that could relate to what I was going through. So I would be really ultra, de really, really depressed at school every day. And then what I would do is I would just hold it in all day and then go home and just cry all the time. And I didn't tell anybody why I was crying. So this went on for a very long period of time. And one day I finally decided 
that I had to tell, I had to tell someone, and I decided I had to tell Tim about how I was feeling. And it just so happened, it was in the bathroom. And when I say it was in the bathroom, I don't mean it was like in the stall. They, they, they had a, they had a separate room for, they, they had a separate room for me with all, with all, with all, with all the stuff I needed. So it wasn't as awkward as it might sound. But um, so one, so one day we went in the room, and I told him what I just told you. And I then I finished with this. I said to him, I'm so sick of these feelings and I'm so sick of all the reminders that I'm seriously contemplating suicide. And what what was so difficult about that for me was that that's what I felt like I needed to do. But I knew in my I knew somewhere inside me that if I was able to do that, I wouldn't want to. So not only was I just ultra depressed, I was also very conflicted with my feelings about how the how I was depressed. And I told him what I just told you, and he told me a story about him that I had never heard before. And this was a story that really strengthened our relationship. See, I had never really s seen that side of Mike. You know, I've always seen the, the happy-go-lucky Mike that you guys are seeing here this morning. So with Mike telling me about his deep and darkest secrets, it, it, it tore me up inside. It broke my heart. I, 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 I was crying my eyes out because I, I didn't know that, I, A, I didn't know that Mike was in that much pain. And then it was just something that, you know, I, I felt bad for my, in myself because I never really noticed it. And I thought, you know, I, here I am thinking that I'm someone who's pretty intuitive and, and, and can pick up on things, and, and I n never picked up on it. So I would never shared, Mike, with some of my history and my past and my, when I was younger. So what I, I thought this would be the perfect time to, to share with Mike so that he understood that he wasn't the only one that was hurting and that here I was that I hurt way back when, but now I got through it. So I, I had told Mike that in my early 20s, I, I dropped out of college. I basically dropped out of life, and I was completely depressed, and I was in a funk, and I didn't, I didn't see a way out of it. So I also contemplated suicide, and I, I was going to end my life. I was going to go to the train tracks, and I was going to bring my Walkman and blare, blare the, uh, the music, and I was going to take a pillow, put it on the tracks, never to wake up again. And I was telling Mike this. And the thing was, I don't know how this came, but I, there was a question that popped in my head that saved my life. And that question was, I asked myself, what would happen to my parents if I went through with it? And it was at that moment that everything changed. I, I'm not going to say I was, I was all better right, right away. But at least it, it, it made me change my focus, and it made me realize that I can't choose that. i got to go forward. And it, it gave me that little sliver of hope that I needed, just a little sliver of hope that I could, that I could get better. So, you know, I, I, I told Mike that, you know, this was something that I, I had been dealing with. And like you know, I said before, we're both just crying, and we're in the bathroom, and we have to go back to class. <laughs> so, you know, we wanted to, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, we needed to kind of compose ourselves. And, I, you know, I remember I looked at Mike, and, and, I, and I used, I kind of changed up a quote from, from a movie, A League of Their Own, and I look at Mike, and I'm like, Mike, there's no crying in high school. <laughs> let's roll out of here, and let's laugh as much as we possibly can. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was a really pivotal moment in our, in our life. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that was, that was a pivotal day for us because, you know, sometimes, sometimes we get so caught up in our differences that we lose sight of our likenesses, of our humanity, of what binds us all together. You know, from that day on, it became my personal mission to help others see Mike the person and not the wheelchair. Mike's an incredible kid. He's lo loving, he's giving, he's intelligent, 
He's hysterical. I knew that others didn't necessarily see that when they saw Mike. So it became my job to help them see that. You know, I always felt that there was a bigger reason, a bigger reason that Mike and I came into each other's lives when we did. And on this one particular day, back in the spring of 2005, I finally started to understand why. Now, summer was around the corner, and I was out of shape. Some things don't change. <laughs> so I dragged my lazy butt off the couch, and I went for a jog. And on this jog, I had an idea, an epiphany, that I would take Mike and his twin brother, and we would go down to Orlando. We're in Chicago. We'd fly down to Orlando, and we'd go to Disney World. And, you know, we'd have as much fun as we could. And then Mike and David would fly back to Chicago, leaving me to run back. And, you know, it was a crazy idea. You know, probably the craziest idea I've ever had. You know, maybe the craziest idea anyone's ever had, right? And um, so I had this idea in April. And, I, I, you know, I, I basically I looked at my calendar. And, and the, only cal the only month in my calendar that was wide open was August 2005. So I'm like, I guess I'm doing it in August. So I, in four frantic months, I, I found uh, a long-distance uh, running coach to help me train and, and get in shape. I had, you know, a lot of my friends helped me with the planning of the logistics. Um, you know, Mike and David came down to Orlando with me to, to see me off. Because on July 31st, 2005, I went for it. And uh, it was that, that run that really that, that brought together, um, you know, kind of everything that we have today. It, that was kind of what, what started it all. Uh, Mike and I, uh, as a result of that run, started the Keep On Keeping On Foundation which is a nonprofit organization in the Chicagoland area dedicated to helping those with special needs. You know, typically, we buy wheelchairs, hospital beds, uh, pay for um, you know, hospital uh, bills, that, that type of thing. And then you know, from, from that came you know, Handicap This, our, our two-man show, and then also you know, our, our speaking. And it really was you know, the, the, the platform for us to, to establish some really cool things. And really what happened, that run, there was a lot of moving pieces in that run, a lot of things that had to come together, a lot of teamwork that had to be developed. And what we thought we'd kind of do is play a little game here today. Um, do you guys remember a song when we were growing up, way back when, called Row, Row, Row Your Boat? Do you guys remember this song? Well, I'm going to make you prove it, okay? I want to hear everyone sing just one verse real quick, Row, Row, Row Your Boat, all right? On the count of three, one two, three. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. I don't see some mouse moving. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. All right, Mike, that was good, right? Yeah. That was good. That was good. That was good. We're, we're, we're missing, we're missing something. Yeah, we are, we're missing a, we're, we gotta, we got we gotta have a play little game here. All right, we're All gonna right. use oh, I this know table right here. I want you guys to stand up. And what are they gonna be, Mike? They're going to be the oars. Oars. You guys are going to be the oars. So be mimic oars, right? All right, now we want, okay, the back, the back room, we want you guys to be what? The wind. The wind. You guys in the back, stand up and be the wind. All right, we're going to use uh, uh, everyone from here back, stand up. Okay. feel like... Jaws. Dun, 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 dun. All right, what else, Mike? What else do we got? So we got, these are the oars. This is the wind. What we else got, do we need, Mike? We got the, we, we got the, wa the water or the waves. The water or the waves. We're going to go, everyone from here back, you guys are the water. So stand up and you guys are going to mimic the water. All right? What else do we got, Mike? One more thing, right? Oh, uh, yeah, trees. Trees. All right, this group right here. You guys are our trees. Stand up and be trees. So we got oars, we got wind, we got trees, and we got water. Right? Okay. On the count of three, the people that are sitting, you guys are the chorus. You have to sing, row, row, row your boat. Everyone else, excuse me, everyone else, we want you to act it out. Act out your job. And we all need, right? We need it with a little feeling. We need a little, little feeling. Come on now. All right? Let's, let's have some fun. Hunt, but if you will. All right, the count of three. One, two, three. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. All right.
guys, give it up. Thanks for playing, guys. That was very nice. My God, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys are probably thinking, well, that was kind of silly. What does that all mean? Oh, I still think that. <laughs> <laughs> you see, we all, we all had a job to do, right? We all had a job. Just like here at APSI, the APSI conference, you and you guys go home, you all have a job to do. And everyone's piece, whether it be the wind, the oars, the water, the trees, you all have a specific job to do. To, and the thing is, one piece can't, one piece doesn't work. None of it works, right? I mean, if you didn't have the trees, you wouldn't have the leaves, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I, yes. I thought you were going to say something. I will. No, I was going to say. Because each piece impacts the other. That's what I was going to say. Right? Yeah, each piece impacts the other. Each piece um, leads to the other, and when you don't, when you take one piece out, yeah, you still have that part, but you still have the other three or four parts, but they don't, they don't work together. They don't work together. It still works to a point, but it's that, it that connection, so it's that working in unison that that's, that's what makes things work, and that's what makes things become a, a field goal for change, and not, not just an idea that someone does for like, a week and then forget about it. Yeah, it, it allows the big picture to develop. And that's what you guys are, in, in general, is the big picture. In, in my life, I've had, let's see, let's see. I gotta do the math, because I've had a lot of these. I've had about 12 surgeries in my life. One more, and it's free. See, I like how that joke always <laughs> takes a minute. It takes a little bit to develop. Yeah. It's like one of those punch cards, you know? Yeah, yes. <laughs> it's like one of those subway punch cards. You get 12 stuff, you get the third one free. In fact, in fact I said, I, I went to the doctor the other day for my leg, for my foot, and I had to if I have surgery, is it free? And believe me, he did not think that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I've had a lot of surgeries on all different parts of my body, but the most invasive was a spinal fusion that I had in the summer of 2006. Now, this fusion, what the, what the surgeons had to do, they had to alleviate the internal pressure that Mike's spine was placing on his organs. So in order to do this, they had to insert two 18-inch metal rods on either side of Mike's spine, and they were attached by 37 screws. This surgery would take over 14 hours to complete. Mike would be laid up on his stomach for six weeks in the middle of summer. And I, I don't know what you guys do in the middle of summer. You might go to the park. You might... I don't know what you do, but I, I, know, I know what I do. Summer to me means only one thing. Prime movie season. And I was not pleased that I would be missing all the summer movies. Because normally I'm like, yeah, come me over, I don't care. I don't care. But I'm, I'm like, oh no, they're doing, they're doing it in June. And I won't be, I won't, I won't be ready, I won't be ready, I won't be able to go see the movie. So I was really, I was really angry. So I had my surgery, and I'm stewing over this. And I noticed that there's a movie theater just a little ways down the street from the hospital. And that got my gears working. The, li the light went up. The, the metaphorical like that, the real life, because we lost, we lost that thing in the flood. But um, <laughs> the me, the meta, the metaphorical light went up on my head. So I said, Doctor, could I take a field trip? Not very long, not very long at all. I don't know why I said it like that. I thought maybe because I sounded more scholarly, she would let me do it. 
So I said, not long at all, just uh, just up and down the road. I don't, I don't know, but then I said, I felt like I was British. <laughs> I said, like I was British. Any, anyway, so she goes, I asked her if I could go to the movies. And this is the literal sound she makes. She goes, eh, I don't see why not. <laughs> So I really like this doctor because she let me obviously. Okay, but um when the doctor is somewhat buzzing, we went off to the movie theater. Now going to the movie theater this time was no easy test. And I will paint you the picture. Okay, so I'm laying on the gurney on my stomach. So this is a what two person job. So my dad, who's sitting right there. In the uh, blue shirt, and in the in the very nice tie, in the very nice tie clip on my head. <laughs> Inside joke, never mind. Uh, so I got I got my I got my dad and I got my uncle who lived down the street from the hospital. And I called my uncle up. I said, Uncle, you want to help me do something medically unwise? <laughs> He said, of course. <laughs> so off to the movies we went. And I'll continue painting the picture. So there we are, downtown Chicago, Michigan Avenue. My dad's on one side, my uncle's on the other. I'm on my stomach, and they're pushing me down Michigan Avenue. Like I said, hitting every pothole. <laughs> no demand. They say, not on purpose, I don't believe them for a second. <laughs> so we brave the minefield of bottles that is Michigan Avenue. And to this day, I can't go down Michigan <laughs> Avenue without, without feeling those bottles. <laughs> because I just, did, I just did it last week, and the memories are still there. So anyway, we get to the, we get to the theater. And uh, we had to clear out the entire back row. I should also mention that I had popcorn. Now, he's going to the movies, isn't going to the movies, unless you have popcorn. And my, and my dad goes, do you really need popcorn? I don't, I don't think this is the right thing to do. This is going to be really hard. I said, I'm the one laying on my stomach. You're the one that can walk. Deal with it. <laughs> which, 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 which is our mantra to this day. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times a day our conversation ends with me saying, deal with it. And he can attest to that. But, but anyway, so the movie starts. I'm eating, I'm eating my popcorn. Now, I didn't time it out too good. Because halfway through the movie, my painkillers started to wear off. Yeah, that's the exact noise I made, except with a lot more expletives. <laughs> but I didn't leave the movie. I pushed through. Because just because something is easy doesn't mean you sh shouldn't do it. It just takes a little creativity and spirit. And that's the reason I'm telling you guys this story. Because in a situation like either mine or your or your um organization's um, mission is to go for a goal. And if it's a difficult goal, if you make that goal, if you push through that goal and if it's difficult and you're able to come out on the other side, not only do you feel better about yourself because you accomplish only for yourself. You also feel more empowered to help other people. And that kind of goes back to the working all together. It's kind of a pay it forward. Because if you're able to do something, you could do something for somebody else, or you could show somebody else how to do it for themselves. Now, I think Michael would agree with this. Is there, you, can, you can find positives anywhere you look. Right, Mike? Yeah. And... When people look at me, or I'll, I'll explain this a little bit, when, uh, people, when people see a person 
who is handicapped or disabled, it's really obvious what the quote-unquote negatives are. And it's really easy to focus on the negatives. But I'm here to tell you that there are some positives about living with a handicap, in my specific case, living with zero quality. And I have a lot of them, but I will give you three of them right now, just as a few examples. All right, first one. First, uh, first other uh, thing about living with a handicap for me. You always have a place to sit. <laughs> Number two. You can come up with creative stories about how you got in the wheelchair and people actually believe you. Because I can't tell you how boring it is to tell people I was born this way. People don't want to hear that. They want to hear it. They want to hear an They want to hear one more interesting story. So I, I try to give them that. So, and they usually believe me. And number three, and this is my personal favorite of this group, because it happens every day, so it's a reminder every day that I get rock star parking anytime, anywhere. <laughs> Mike Berkson. Mike's my, my best friend, my brother, my teacher, my inspiration. I really don't know where I'd be if Mike hadn't come to my life when he did. Working with Mike has given me a gift. It's allowed my talents to shine through. And in return, Mike's talents have shined on me. When, when he laughs, it gives me strength. When he smiles, it gives me hope. When he believes in me, it gives me the courage to march forth, to keep on keeping on. Mike is just as unique as any one of us. Is it because of his handicaps or in spite of them? Who knows? What I do know is it's people like Mike that make it possible for people like me to, to see the greatness within myself, but also see the greatness in others and, and, and to dare to achieve my own goals and dreams. I might be Mike's arms and legs, but Mike's my breath. Do I want your sympathy? <laughs> of course not. That's about as useful to me as a pencil. Do I, do I want your respect? Sure, but only about earning. So what, what I want you to, so what I want you to do, and I was a lot of way. Here. See, Mike, Mike's, Mike's handicap is manifested physically. Yours may be manifested differently. But that's what makes us all unique. And once we can embrace these unique qualities, it'll make our lives and the lives around us infinitely better. Improvise, adapt, overcome. That's how we roll. So when someone tells you it can't be done, or you're not good enough. When you're facing a thousand miles to reach your goal. Well, all you want to do is go ahead. When someone tells you that pre-vocation is the best solution. <laughs> I'm glad they enjoyed that. <laughs> or they refuse to look past someone's disability. When someone dismisses your dreams. Or refuses to accept you as you. Take our story with you. And then my wheelchair be your inspiration. We are Handicap, handicap this. this. Thank, Thank you very you much, FC. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I think this is on, yes, okay. Woo. All right, thank you, wow, that was fantastic. Can we have another round of applause? That was so great, thank you. And I think that's what, this is what we're all about, exactly what, what they talked about. I mean, this is why we're here, this is what we all believe. So I think this was a, a great way of opening our conference.